150 years ago, characters in a Dickens novel would answer the question, how much do you think he's worth, with, I reckon Pip's worth at least 500 pounds a year. In this talk on stock market risk, we'll explore five different perspectives and see that questions such as how we measure our wealth can have a big impact on how we view this risk. Let's start with a look at the past. The most well-known stock market crash is the 80% drop in the U.S. market from 1929 to 1932. Not so commonly known is that there were six other episodes in which investors lost 40 to 50%. While these were painful market busts, we need to keep in mind that the U.S. stock market has been a star performer on the world stage. And so focusing on U.S. performance is likely to lead us to underestimate risk an effect known as survivorship bias. We need to bear in mind that some markets didn't survive at all, such as those in Russia and China. What if we don't know much about history? From first principles, what can we say about how much the stock market can go down? The present value of an equity investment depends on two things, the expected cash flow stream, think dividends, and the expected rate of return used for present valuing those cash flows. Since equity cash flows go far out into the future, small changes in cash flow or expected return have a big impact on prices. For instance, if companies suffer earnings declines and cut their dividends by 40% in the long term, and at the same time investors demand a 3% higher expected return, stock prices would fall by 70%, which tells us that the 1929 stock market crash was not a one in a million fluke. So what can we conclude from the perspectives of history and first principles? Equities can go down a lot. Modern academic finance describes risk with a more forward-looking perspective. Using concepts such as continuous time random walks, bell-shaped normal distributions, the standard deviation of returns, and risk implied by options markets. Unfortunately, markets misbehave and don't fit these neat paradigms. Stock prices exhibit fat tails, which partly result from the fact that markets are made of people, and people, especially in groups, can get really carried away. With these caveats in mind, we can get some useful insights on stock market risk from the theories of modern finance. Let's use a simple graph. First, notice that risk measured in terms of investment value grows with time, but it grows more slowly the further we go out. Under the simplest assumptions, it grows with the square root of time, so four years of risk is twice as much as one year of risk. However, if we redraw the graph looking at risk in annual rates of return, we see that risk measured this way goes down with time, which may be one reason why investors with long time horizons tend to be more comfortable with heavier allocations to equities. Maybe we should be a little more tolerant of equity market risk when we take the perspective that everything else we can invest in also bears risk, even cash which we often mistakenly think of as risk-free. For example, an investor in U.S. T-bills would have lost over 40% after inflation from 1941 to 1948. Ouch! Finally, if we go back to the perspective of Dickens and his characters, who viewed wealth as an income stream rather than a lump sum capital value, equities feel even less risky. While dividends are volatile, they tend to be less volatile than stock prices, which are a function not only of dividends, but also of the expected return used to discount those cash flows. For example, over the past 150 years, U.S. stock prices fell on average twice as much as dividends declined in the four worst bear markets. We've covered five perspectives on stock market risk. Which is most relevant depends on what we're trying to achieve with our investments in the first place. Are we saving for consumption or to leave to our kids or philanthropy? Or is wealth simply a scorecard? 
If we're investing to consume in the future, then perhaps the way Dickens saw it is most relevant, and we should be concerned with shortfall risk and the variability of our real income stream. If it's for our kids or philanthropy, then the value of our investments at some distant date is most relevant. Interestingly, if that horizon is long enough, we should be hoping for markets to go down so we can invest our dividends and future savings at lower equity valuations, a point made by Warren Buffett. Finally, if our wealth is just a scorecard, then it's how we're doing relative to our peers that matters, and perversely, not owning equities can be riskier than owning them. Once we've chosen the perspective on risk that best fits our objectives, then comes the really hard part, staying the course and resisting those pesky animal spirits that whisper in our ears, tempting us to abandon our well-laid plans, usually at just the wrong time.